The Hoover Institution is the nation's preeminent research center dedicated to generating policy ideas that promote economic prosperity, national security, and democratic governance. Hoover research has directly led to policies that have produced greater opportunity and freedom in the United States and the world. How has Hoover achieved this distinction? By assembling an extraordinary fellowship of policy-oriented academics and scholarly practitioners, by offering open access to a world-renowned library and archives, and by resolutely focusing on ideas that define a free society. Herbert Hoover is the founder of the institution that bears his name. After graduating in Stanford's pioneer class in 1895, he became a successful mining engineer, renowned humanitarian, and president of the United States. While administering famine relief to Belgium during World War I and participating in the subsequent Paris Peace Conference, Hoover recognized the importance of collecting historical material that could yield knowledge about preventing a recurrence of the calamities he had witnessed in Europe. In April 1919, he pledged $50,000 to Stanford University to support his war collection. We celebrate this pivotal moment 100 years ago as the founding of what was to become the Hoover Institution. By 1929, Hoover's War Library contained 1.4 million items and had already become the largest in the world focused on the Great War and its aftermath. Collecting expanded to include material related to social, political, and economic change in the 20th century. Hoover Tower was completed in 1941 to house the rapidly growing library and archive. In 1957, the collection was definitively renamed the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace. Hoover's vision for the institution is captured in a statement to the Stanford Board of Trustees in 1959. The institution supports the Constitution of the United States, its Bill of Rights, and its method of representative government. The overall mission of this institution is, from its records, to recall the voice of experience against the making of war, and by the study of these records and their publication, to recall man's endeavors to make and preserve peace, the institution itself must constantly and dynamically point the road to peace, to personal freedom, and to the safeguards of the American system. By the 1970s, the institution was generating influential research on government regulation, tax policy, national security, health care, social security, energy, and proposals to limit government expenditures. Many innovative public policy proposals developed by Hoover Fellows were adopted in the 1980s, and Hoover contributed influential policy ideas for countering communism that ultimately led to the collapse of the former Soviet Union in 1991. The all-volunteer army, the flat tax, the Taylor rule for monetary policy, and school choice and accountability are all transformative policy ideas generated by Hoover Fellows. Hoover's timeless fundamental values of freedom, private enterprise, and limited effective representative government derive from 100 years of scholarship and the lessons of history. The Hoover Institution is poised for even greater impact in the years ahead, informing the marketplace of ideas, advising the country's policymakers, and illuminating the road to prosperity and peace in America and around the world. This lecture series brings together Hoover Fellows to discuss how the ideas and values that have undergirded the institution for 100 years remain crucial in understanding and formulating public policy in the 21st century. In recent years, we've become aware of new pernicious threats to our free and open societies. Those threats include new arenas of competition, especially those involving perception, disinformation, and propaganda. And what we're seeing is adversaries attacking our confidence, our confidence in our democratic principles and institutions and processes, as well as confidence in our free market economic systems. What is key to free and open societies is critical thinking. It's the critical thinking mind. If you shut that off, then you have a closed mind, you have a closed community, you have repression, you have oppression, you have a degeneration of society. We have adversaries right now. It's Russia, it's China, um, and it's radical Islamic ideology. 
And each one of them laughs at us when we talk about critical thinking, we talk about free open society, we talk about freedom. They laugh at us and they say, well, we'll see how far you can bring that. And our laws and our constitutions protect the individual's rights to think, to express himself or herself, to associate, to engage in free press, to do whatever it is that they want to do. One of the biggest threats to free and open societies around the world is the rise of a Chinese Communist Party state to superpower status in the world, a state that is using covert, coercive, and corrupting mechanisms to try to disrupt and subvert uh, the integrity of our democratic institutions, whether it's Chinese overseas students studying in the United States, American reporters and scholars trying to get open access to China, the flows of influence and money to think tanks and universities. We have to demand transparency and reciprocity in the U.S.-China relationship, and we have to support the integrity and capacity of our democratic institutions to engage China on an equal and vigilant basis. So we might set some goals for ourselves, goals involving competing more effectively, more competently in these new arenas of competition and then also restoring our confidence. Confidence in who we are, confidence in our democratic principles, our institutions, and confidence in our free market economic system. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Gilligan. I'm the director of the Hoover Institution. I want to welcome you to this fourth session of our Centennial Speaker Series entitled, A Century of Ideas for a Free Society. This series features 11 panel discussions over the course of the year to showcase the scholarship and research central to the institution's mission and values. At this time, let me introduce the participants of today's discussion entitled, The Battlegrounds of Perception, Countering Threats to Free and Open Societies. Ayan Hersey Ali is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. She served as a minister of the Dutch Parliament from 2003 to 2006. While in Parliament, she focused on furthering the integration of non-Western immigrants into Dutch society and on defending the rights of Muslim women. Larry Diamond is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. For more than six years, he directed FSI's Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law where he now leads the program on Arab reform and democracy and its global digital policy incubator. H.R. McMaster is the Fouad and Michelle Ajami Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He was the 26th Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and served as a commissioned officer in the United States Army for 34 years before retiring as a Lieutenant General in June of 2018. The moderator for today's panel is Neil Ferguson. Neil is the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and a Senior Fellow of the Center for European Studies at Harvard, where he served for 12 years as a Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of History. Please join me in welcoming this esteemed group to the stage. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Tom, for that introduction. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us on such a beautiful afternoon when you could be out playing Frisbee. <laughs> I'm extremely excited to be moderating uh, this distinguished panel. When you come to think of it, we have some just amazing expertise uh, up here on the platform. We have a former national security advisor who really was the mastermind behind a thorough remaking of national security strategy back in uh, 2018, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, his contribution to, uh, to that. Uh, uh, to my far left, uh, Larry Diamond, whose uh, recent role as editor of a major report on Chinese influence operations has caused a major uh, stir all around the world, both sides of the Pacific. Uh, and sitting in my immediate uh, left, Ayan Hersey Ali, who has been the leading, I think, the leading critic of Islamic extremism uh, and fundamentalism 
and I should, in the interests of full disclosure, acknowledge that she also happens to be my wife. Uh, <laughs> but let me reassure you, uh, there will be no softball questions <laughs> on this panel. I want to begin with a quotation from one of the, and this is a, this is a, a first actually, yeah. I think the first time we've ever appeared on stage together. We, yeah. we put it off and put it off and finally Hoover talked us into it. Incidentally, our, our, our two sons are the first Hoover fellows to be bred in captivity. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I want to begin uh, on a more serious note uh, by quoting from one of the uh, grand masters of strategic uh, thought and American foreign policy, Henry Kissinger, who, uh, for a man who just turned 96, has an astonishingly acute grasp of the issues that we're going to be discussing uh, this afternoon. Uh, he has written uh, on artificial intelligence, uh, and in his book, uh, World Order, he made the following observation, and I quote, the pervasiveness of network communications in the social, financial, industrial, and military sectors has revolutionized vulnerabilities. Outpacing most rules and regulations, and indeed the technical comprehension of many regulators, it has in some respects created the state of nature, the escape from which according to Hobbes, provided the motivating force for creating a political order. Asymmetry and a kind of congenital world disorder are built into relations between cyber powers, both in diplomacy and in strategy. Absent articulation of some rules of international conduct, a crisis will arise from the inner dynamics of the system. A couple more quotes just to frame the subject, Admiral Michael Rogers, former head of the National Security Agency and US Cyber Command, said a couple of years ago, we're at a tipping point. And finally, I want to quote from NSA cryptographer Robert Morris Sr., his famous rules of computer security. And you may want to make a note of these, ladies and gentlemen, because everybody these days has to be concerned about computer security. Rule one, do not own a computer. <laughs> Rule two, do not power it on. Rule three, do not use it. <laughs> With that to set the scene, I want to turn to H.R. McMaster. General, I, I want to ask you about the national security strategy uh, to begin with, because it really did radically change the US posture on a range of issues, of which probably the most noteworthy was our stance towards China. But it had some very interesting things to say about cyber warfare. Uh, and I'll, I'll just briefly remind you of something that you said. Cyber attacks offer adversaries low cost and deniable opportunities to seriously damage or disrupt critical infrastructure, cripple American businesses, weaken our federal networks, and attack the tools and devices that Americans use every day to communicate and conduct business. The United States will impose swift and costly consequences on foreign governments, criminals, and other actors who undertake significant malicious cyber activities. So let me begin with a question. Can there be effective deterrence in cyberspace? Thanks, thank you, Neil. Well, you asked overall, too, really what, what motivated, I think, the, this dramatic shift in policy that you saw broadly in the, in the December 2017, highly readable, just in time for the beach for all of you, <laughs> national security strategy. 2017, I got the date. No, I'm but sorry. December, December. It was 2018 is really when we really were able to put all this in place. And, and, um, and I, I think it was really a sense that we were at the end of the beginning of a new era, but we were behind. We were behind largely because we were not competing effectively against adversaries and rivals. And the reasons that we were behind is, is due in large measure to overconfidence, overconfidence in the 90s associated with our triumph in the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the lopsided victory over the sixth largest army in the world during the, during the 1991 Gulf War, and you know, a period of sustained economic growth through the 90s, what some people called the revolution in military affairs associated with these technologies, uh, the first big dot-com boom here in, in the valley as, as well. And so we, we were, I think, flushed with this overconfidence that led to complacency. 
And then we, we confronted some difficulties in the 2000s. Obviously, the mass murder attack against our nation on September 11th, 2001, uh, and unanticipated length and difficulty of wars in, in Iraq and, and in Afghanistan, and of course, the 2008 financial crisis. And I think that jolted our confidence in a way that we actually became, I think, passive and didn't engage competitively for reasons of pessimism rather than over optimism. And so we, we made a conscious choice to really figure out how to re-enter arenas of competition from which we had been absent. Cyber is one of those. And to answer your question more succinctly at this point is, is that yes, I think you can deter certain attacks in cyberspace really by two fundamental means. One which was alluded to in that paragraph, which is to Im impose costs on a cyber actor or make clear that you can impose costs far beyond those which the cyber actor factored in at the outset of the decision to attack you. Now those are cyber offensive capabilities, but also capabilities outside of cyberspace that, that, that you can bring to bear American power in physical space through sanctions and law enforcement uh, actions, but when, when you, you have the authority to do so, military action a, a, as well. But the other aspect of deterrence is really, to go back to Thomas Schelling in the 1960s, deterrence by denial, convincing potential adversaries that they cannot accomplish their objectives through the use of that capability. And that involves some defensive measures uh, in fact, uh, are making our infrastructure more resilient and, and, and ensuring that any systems, any of our systems can degrade gracefully rather than fail catastrophically. We have a, a recent reminder, obviously, of this, of this uh, ransomware attack on the city of Baltimore, for, ex for example. These are problems that are with us right now. And I think we have to recognize that our enthusiasm for technologies that, has ma that made our lives so much easier have also made us more vulnerable and maybe prone to catastrophic collapse. I mean, I, I'm reminded of Elting Morrison's book from the, from the 1960s as well, entitled Men, Machines, and Modern Times. And in it, he said that, that man and woman, and he's writing in the 60s, you know, has, have expended a great deal uh, of effort in trying to tame his natural environment, but in so doing has created an artificial environment that is much more complex than, than the natural environment ever was. And so I think we're, we're on the right track uh, in terms of recognizing this as a, a competitive domain. Uh, I think you've seen a lot of, of critical actions taken to make it easier to use, for example, offensive capabilities as a part of deterrence and defense. Uh, but I think there's certainly a, lo a long way to go, both on deterrence by denial and the ability to impose costs. Uh, before I turn to Ayan and, and Larry, I want to pursue this a bit further because we, we have an opportunity to learn from somebody who, remember, has been right there in the room where it happens, making and remaking American policy. Joe Nye uh, of Harvard wrote a, a recent article on this subject, and I'll quote from it. Deterrence in cyberspace is more like crime governments can only imperfectly prevent it. So it's not really like deterrence in the age of, of the Cold War, where you had to deter the Soviet Union from firing a missile, because if they fired a missile, that was it. We were in World War III and Armageddon. This is a slightly different kind of deterrence. You're going to have cyber attacks. In some ways, cyber warfare is a permanent state. It's just a question of whether you can keep the level down so that you don't suffer serious disruption. Is that the right way to think about it? I, I think that is the right way to think about it, because I think cyber actors are trying to avoid the imposition of costs back on, on them as well. And, and, uh, and cyber is a way uh, where we have seen uh, rivals, uh, competitors such as Russia, China, but North Korea as well, and Iran, try to accomplish objectives below the threshold that would elicit a concerted response back against them. And so I think we, we have to do a number of things. Uh, one, one is to develop a range of capabilities that can be applied against these actors. I think you've seen that in the last election, for example, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the midterm elections. Uh, I think more and more will probably be known over time. But we did act, I think, much more aggressively than we had in the past against those who were trying to disrupt our, our elections. And there, and there are other actions we can take, though, as well, that aren't purely defensive, 
but, but in many ways inoculate ourselves against the effects. And I know that, that Larry and Ayana are going to talk more about influence operations and cyber-enabled information warfare. But we can do, we, we can undertake a lot of important tasks like educating ourselves and our public so we're less susceptible to manipulation by these actors. Or we can figure out a way to present credible information you know, based on you know, verifiable sources uh, and be able to access that routinely in a way that just sort of blocks out you know, some, of, some of that attempts at disinformation and, and propaganda. Can we draw that distinction out a little bit more? Because I think there is a distinction to be drawn between cyber warfare and information war. And in some ways, the United States spent much more time thinking about cyber warfare prior to 2016, maybe because we kind of invented it. And our assumption was, well, if we can do certain things to Iran, sooner or later, somebody's going to try and do those to us. So we should be really worried about computer viruses and malware that might disrupt the software that controls our critical infrastructure. And that was our focus. Right. Uh, but in fact, what the Russians did in 2016 was something quite different, which was information warfare. Can you help us understand the difference? Well, I, I think that what we, it gives, gives back to this complacency problem. I think that we believed in the 1990s, a corollary to this sort of overconfidence, is, is that we believed that there was an arc of history that had guaranteed the primacy of our free and open societies over closed authoritarian systems. And, and then it really is, it was our confidence that came under attack, our confidence in who we are as a people People, our common identity. We know that 80% of the of the of the of the messaging and bot traffic uh, and so forth uh, on on social media from the Internet Research Agency, right? The 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 uh, you know the, the GRU, the Russian intelligence arm, was aimed at dividing Americans along uh, along lines of race. Uh, the second highest, you know, distant second was on immigration and then gun control. Whatever could be a polarizing issue that can pull our polity, our society apart from each other and pit us against each other and then to attack our election so that we also don't have faith in our democratic processes and institutions. Uh, and so I, I think that, that we came late to the game on this. We certainly did. And I think it was, again, because we were overconfident in just the inherent strength of our society and, and our system. And I'm glad you observed a moment ago that we did up our game. And although it didn't get much coverage, the fact that there wasn't effective disruption of the 2018 midterms has to be down to the way the administration hit back at the, uh, the Internet Research Agency and actually disrupted its communications. So you, you could, I think, say that we did learn and learn pretty quickly from 2016. And I think one of the lessons overall, to get back to your point on deterrence, is you can't separate in cyberspace offensive and defensive. And we know it's, sort of pub it's public knowledge that you know, if you develop a cyber tool and you use it, it has a shelf life of about 96 hours until there's a countermeasure de de deployed against it. So what you have is what Clausewitz said war is, right? a continuous interaction of opposites. And that's happening now you know, at, at electron speed uh, internationally in, in this new form of competition. And so what we had to do is, is align the authorities for those who are operating to defend us, to defend us from, from these, uh, th these actors, uh, to, to employ combinations of offensive and defensive capabilities. So this is a good moment to turn from, from you to Ayan and, <laughs> and remind ourselves that although there has not been a major Islamist terrorist attack in the United States for some time, it hasn't stopped around the world. And just to remind the audience, this, these are numbers from the US National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and responses to terrorism, that their most recent report, data for 2017, records 10,900 terrorist attacks of all kinds around the world, which killed more than 26,400 people. The top three perpetrators were Islamic State, the Taliban, and Al-Shabaab. Overwhelmingly, the terrorist incidents around the world that kill people in large numbers are driven by or perpetrated by radical Islamist groups. So I wanted to begin with a question about those groups. The ways in which they have used the technology developed in the West to organize, uh, to mobilize, 
and to build far bigger networks than Al-Qaeda had back in 2001. Talk a bit about that, educators, about how these networks currently operate. Well, thanks. I, I wanted to start by, you know, I, I was listening intently to my colleague HR and thinking, okay, so here we are talking about operations. <clears throat> this is cyber. Here are the people who are using, our adversaries who are using cyber. And in the 15 years that I've been in the United States, the one thing, uh, maybe even since 1980, 1989, the one thing we rarely talk about, uh, ideas, ideologies, and grounding principles. So when HR said, you know, the very core of our identity, I automatically assume very subjectively that the core of our identity is, are these classical liberal ideas that the United States is established upon. And what we then forget is that there are, in fact, um, people who organize, who have political and social frameworks that are radically different from ours. So when you think about Islamism, it is a political and social philosophy with a religious underpinning. And when the agents of these, or the people who believe in this ideology, um, I think you look at Islamism and you see a tree with two main branches. And one branch is the use of violence to achieve their aims, to achieve what they think of as their utopian idea. And the utopian ideal is to establish a society on a local level, regional level, and maybe on a global level to uh, achieve an end goal that society is based on the rule of God. That's their interpretation. That's, that's their organizing philosophy. Now, there's this, think of it as a tree. So one branch is then the use of violence to reach that goal, and that's called jihad. And I think most Americans, everywhere I go, I ask people, raise your hand if you think you know of the concept of jihad. Just raise your hand. And that's exactly it. A lot of people, maybe 80 to 90% of a room like this one will say, I've heard of the concept of jihad, I've read about it, I'm familiar with it. And then I ask people, raise your hand if you've ever heard of the concept of dawah. So it's one, two, three, four. There's always a minority. But that is the other main branch of the Islamist tree. And what does that mean? It means that the believers in this particular political and social philosophy that has its underpinnings in religion um, uses or puts together an effort in you know, engaging in campaigns, arguments, thinking, propaganda. In short, it is the effort to promote the ideas. It's the effort to persuade. And that's where cyber comes into. I know that when it comes to jihad, and we are focusing on that, and you know these big companies, Google, Twitter, whatever, they are focusing on um, the jihadi aspects. When are they plotting a terrorist attack? Where is that terrorist attack going to be? What kind of medium are they going to use? That is all in the, under the branch of jihad. But when it comes to dawah, you have to ask yourself, what are they, how are they using cyber to raise awareness, to recruit people to their cause? How are they using cyber to organize, to strategize, to exchange tips and tactics? How are they using cyber to raise money? And yes, information warfare. How are they using to uh, propagate conspiracy theories? The United States of America is out to get all Muslims. That is one conspiracy theory. Uh, they're colluding with the state of Israel to destroy Islam. That's another conspiracy theory. If you ask me, I will say the concept of Islamophobia, I put it under that realm of uh, disinformation and information warfare. And that's how it's used. And I think everything that my colleague HR said is absolutely true. We are used to fighting these operational wars, you know, the two things that you mentioned, make sure that, you know, uh, you impose cost on them 
and denial, uh, sorry, what did you say, defense by denial. That works on the operational level, but the question remains, are we really engaged in terms of this ideological confrontation, and are we not really wasting the opportunity to use the internet, to use cyber to promote a counter ideology and a counter idea and a counter system of ideas. And I think that's where we are failing. So one of the things that most uh, struck me when I was writing a, a book related to all this, The Square and the Tower, was how very different Islamic State was from Al-Qaeda. Because Al-Qaeda had carried out the 9-11 attacks partly because it was so cut off and closed as a tiny conspiratorial network that it pretty much was undetected by our security forces. Whereas Islamic State is quite different. It is a very open, though rapidly changing network that uses social media, uses all kinds of different platforms to disseminate its ideology. And you look at some of the work that's been done by people in national security in the US that graphs the network of Islamic State activity online. And it's absolutely mind blowing how big this thing is and how sophisticated. So is it the right to say that Islamic State may have been defeated on the ground mm -hmm. in, in Syria, mm -hmm. but it is still very much alive in cyberspace? So think of Islamic State as only one brand of this global phenomenon of Islamists. Al-Qaeda is just another brand of Islamists. And Al-Qaeda failed because they put all their money on the jihadist branch. They thought we're just gonna shock the world into uh, submitting to our view. And that didn't happen. They were obliterated, or almost obliterated. And obviously they adapt like we adapt. They learn from their mistakes like we learn from our mistakes. And I think they've always gone back to, well, let's develop or redevelop or refocus on that Dawa branch, on persuading individuals, getting into the minds of human beings to persuade them to come to our viewpoint. And a way to do that is through schools, it's through families, it's through neighborhoods, it's through communities, and obviously it's through the internet. And they're making use of all um, these various tools that are available to all of us. Now, I want to say, we in the United States, or people who try and study because we are academics, we try to draw these straight lines of distinction between Al-Qaeda, between um, Islamic State, between the Muslim Brotherhood and other organizations, but that's not how it works. You have to think of them. If the global tree, if the tree is Islamism, they have their disagreements on tactics, they have their disagreements on how to get to the end goal, but remember, they agree on the end goal. So a lot of communication takes place, a lot of collaboration, a lot of exchange of money, a lot of you know, commitments, all of that happens, and much of it happens through cyber, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that while we focus on brands like Islamic State, we're missing the big picture. I see right now reconfigurations, reunions between the Islamic State and the Muslim Brotherhood. <laughs> Al-Qaeda and some of the Iranian Shia Islamists. But you read any of our newspapers and you'll be told the Sunnis and the Shias are killing one another. That is the case, but that's only part of the story. And some, a lot of the communication takes place through um, cyber, through the internet. But then when our government, as HR described, makes it very difficult for them to use cyber, they, use, they turn back to the old methods of communicating and carrying out. So one, one question I wanted to ask you specifically about Dawa, nonviolent extremism, right. is how important the internet is in the process of radicalization. Often one reads, usually after a terrorist attack in, in Europe or somewhere else, that the perpetrator was radicalized online. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that actually what happens? I, uh, yes, there is a school of thought, uh, a number of people who believe if we shut off all of their social media accounts and all their internets, then radicalization would be minimized or would disappear, and I tend to disagree with that, and I think that by the time an individual goes to his smartphone or 
laptop or whatever to access any of these uh, social media tools, they have already at least been inspired. That is, that at a minimum, they've been inspired to rethink things. Now, I think mostly of young people. They're looking for some kind of moral guideline. And when you think about morality in your 15, 16, 17, I think very often, outside of the West, about 90% of people will think about going to their religion. Now, you, ca you can go to your local imam, but most of those local imams have been displaced. Uh, countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar have put a lot of money into putting their own imams and their messages and an, an entire infrastructure in place that has displaced that local, you know, get along Islam that was established in most places in the world. So you're a young person, you live here, you live in the UK, you live in Bangladesh or in Sri Lanka, you're thinking about the difference between right and wrong, you think you're going to your local imam, you go to the mosque and you listen to a sermon. And they tell you about this worldview that is so coherent, so clear with its rewards in the hereafter and the sacrifices that you have to make. And it is only then, because it is so complex, that I think many individuals think, well, because they give you references, like we give references. At the end of my talk, I say, why don't you go to the Hoover Institution website? Or why don't you go to the classical liberal website, this, that, and the other? They do the same thing, and that's what you see happening on cyber. People then coming onto these references and thinking, okay, now I'm going to get more information, more information, and they get sucked in. But cyber is only part of the story in it, when it's used that way. I'm going to come back to a bigger question that I want to ask you about the open society and its enemies, since the open yes, society that's what it is, yeah. is in uh, the title of, our, of our, our event. And I know that you're a devoted reader of Karl Popper, but I want to turn now to, to Larry. And, uh, and we've, we've talked about Russia. We've talked about Islam. Let's talk about China. You, your influence operations report mm. talked quite a bit about technology theft, but it struck me that it said relatively little about China's online activity. And I'd like to ask you to talk a bit about that. I, I wonder if we ain't seen nothing yet, because in some ways, compared with the Russians, the Chinese yeah. haven't really begun information warfare. Should we be bracing ourselves for that now? Well, uh, thank you, Neil, uh, for that uh, question. Uh, I want to begin, since we're now talking about China, um, by noting that uh, 30 years ago today, the Chinese Communist Party state ordered the People's Liberation Army into Tiananmen Square and used a massive and brutal military force to suppress what was probably uh, certainly uh, the most important democracy uprising since the Nationalist Revolution. We don't know how many people died in Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square. The estimates are somewhere between 2,500 and 10,000 people. Uh, but it was a seminal moment in the history of modern China and marked, as the brilliant essay by my co-editor of that report, Neil uh, Orville Schell, noted in his uh, superb article in the Wall Street Journal on Saturday, a, a really uh, decisive pivot away for, from reform and toward the neo-totalitarian Orwellian and now I'd say increasingly aggressive state that uh, the People's Republic of China has become. Um, I think that before we talk about the cyber element of this in China, which I'll come to, we need to talk about generally what they're doing. And uh, no state in the world has a more dedicated international uh, and institutionalized within the Communist Party apparatus. We've got a whole complicated chart in our report that just unveils and maps the bureaucracy um, that has a more dedicated infrastructure for propaganda and the promotion of influence around the world in uh, subterranean uh, and illicit fashion. Uh, than the uh, People's Republic of China has. And you don't, as Ion just said, you don't have to be doing this online in order to have um, tremendous uh, impact. Uh, and, you know, they've got now, uh, they have gathered all of their uh, 
communications uh, channels, the China Global Television, China Radio International, the Xinhua News Agency, and everything else they've got into something they've called a very original title, The Voice of China. And this is increasingly uh, centrally directed as part of a massive campaign to propagate uh, you know, their narrative around the world, to suppress other narratives, to buy up uh, newspapers and inserts in newspapers and radio stations, to uh, propagate a dominant line. And one of the most disturbing things that our report found, again, not yet coming to the online element, is that if you look at the Chinese language media in Australia, in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, in the major democracies of the world, forget about Africa and Latin America for the moment, it's now predominantly parroting a pro-Beijing line. So in our democracies, we have lost freedom and pluralism of information. And what we have is Chinese state Communist Party propaganda and Chinese direct intimidation within our countries of alternative voices to the point where I was just informed yesterday of a city council member, I won't name the city, uh, but you know, uh, let's say it's in California, uh, who, was, uh, who was told by an official of the Chinese consulate that if he met with a representative of the Taiwan uh, representative office, uh, the Chinese overseas community would mobilize their power to defeat this person in the next election. This is happening in the United States of America, not in some Asian semi-democracy or in Latin America or something like that. So we have a very serious problem. Then when you, and of course, we can look at what they're doing to penetrate the media, uh, the, the universities of the United States, not just the Confucius Institutes, more than 150 of them in the United States, where the Chinese Communist Party Ministry of Education is writing the curriculum and appointing the instructors to teach Chinese language in the United States, something that I find inexplicable that we're letting happen in the United States of America. Uh, and that I think we could end very simply by simply adding a new National Defense Education Act that provides for federal government funding of Chinese language instruction in the United States, which is an important national security objective. But let me add, Neil, um, that we engaged um, to, to build on uh, HR's point about overconfidence and, and complacency. We engaged in the late 1990s in a bipartisan act of unilateral disarmament. Uh, Jesse Helms wanted to shrink the international affairs budget. The Clinton administration wasn't ready to fight it and had a number of other bi uh, uh, priorities. It was basically give me your left arm, USAID, or your right arm, USIA. And so the Clinton administration surrendered and closed down the US Information Agency, which was our instrument for fighting communist and terrorist, illiberal and authoritarian propaganda around the world. That got merged into the State Department, into a new uh, bureau of um, public diplomacy that has had, on average, about one uh, undersecretary every 18 months, and it's never been effective. Now recently, again, fortunately, a bipartisan initiative, we've seen the creation and under Secretary Pompeo, it didn't happen under the previous secretary, a serious effort to stand up a global engagement center to wage this battle of ideas. It's going to have, it must have, a digital counter-narrative and counter-messaging component. But that isn't enough. A lot of the way that people get news and information is not digitally, it's the old-fashioned way, by reading newspapers, listening to the radio, and so on and so forth. And let's say we're talking about a closed society, which we need to penetrate in Iran or North Korea in particular. Um, how are we going to get through there? In, in North Korea, it's not going to be by digital means. But we could take the entire, or not maybe the entire, but quite a large swath of the uh, classic canon of liberal ideas that I think Ayan was referring to, put it on thumb drives, and infiltrate 
quite a large number of them at very low cost into the People's Republic of China, into um, North Korea, and into a lot of non-permissive societies. These aren't even expensive initiatives, but you know, we're not thinking creatively enough, and we really aren't yet, even now, when we are getting more serious, I don't think we are matched and resolved from the, for the era that we're in. Is, that, is this a structural problem? The Chinese are, have an authoritarian system. They have a great firewall to keep content out that they don't like. They have the golden shield for online surveillance. They have the great cannon which they can point right. at anybody that uh, they want to take down. And it just seems to me that it's become a very asymmetrical contest. It has. Even if we do, as you're saying, Fundamentally, we're an open society, and it's harder for us to do to them what they can do to us, no? Well, uh, that is absolutely true. We note that in the report. That is why uh, we stress in the report the need, um, which uh, whatever your may, opinion may be of other policies of the Trump administration, uh, the Trump administration is pursuing vigorously, and I'd say, um, with some considerable effectiveness to get more reciprocity in the relationship. We can't just sit back passively and say, we'll wage this battle with uh, one arm tied behind our back when they have kind of all four limbs to run with. And that means if, um, uh, if our media companies, our television companies, this is my own opinion, I, actually I will, I will concede to you, I couldn't sell it to my working group, but <laughs> nevertheless I feel it very strongly. If we can't get our cable television uh, channels to be able to broadcast, whether it's in English or Chinese, to the Chinese public, why should uh, China Global Television have a access to our cable television uh, airways? That's not obvious to me. Uh, if our uh, scholars and uh, journalists are increasingly being threatened with visa denials uh, if they say or write something critical of Xi Jinping or the Chinese Communist Party leadership, why should they continue to have unfettered access in the other direction? These are some of the ways that I think we will never uh, eliminate the asymmetry, but I think we can narrow it and fight back. I want to say one other thing, Neil. It's asymmetrical in both directions because we have an intrinsic advantage here uh, that they don't have. And that is, I feel this very, very deeply. The truth is on our side uh, if we can mobilize it and, um, and, uh, and broadcast it and penetrate it and counter the lying narratives against it around the world. You know, Edward R. Murrow, who was John F. Kennedy's, I think, founding director of the U.S. Information Agency, had a, a very good line. He said, the truth is the best propaganda, and lies are the worst. Because lies eventually can be exposed, but we need to expose them. And that means in Africa, in Latin America, we have to show people the truth about this society. What are people going to decide about the relative value of the two systems when they really get a rounded exposure to the United States with all our divisions, with all our warts, with all our flaws, and see two million people mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, Muslim minority uh, Uyghur uh, ethnicity in Xinjiang province sitting in concentration camps purely because of their ethnicity. Most people don't know that, and we need to make sure they do. And we have evidence to show them. I'm really struck listening to you, Larry, by the, the echoes of the Cold War. And, and you're harking back to what well, that's we your word, not did mine. in the Cold War. <laughs> well, if you're citing Kent, the Kennedy administration's efforts to counter Soviet propaganda, you've taken us back there. And I wanted to turn this back to HR. Uh, there is a sense that we are moving towards, if we're not already, in Cold War II. And in Cold War II, we will be having to do just the kind of things that Larry is talking about. We'll have to have a much more coherent sense of the need to combat the other side's propaganda. When you were in government, how did you think about this? And has your view changed since you came here to Hoover in civilian life? Well, Neil's a fellow historian. <laughs> you, know, you know that we're, we are skeptical about facile uses of historical analogies. And it's important to look at every situation 
on its own terms while learning really from observations about past experience in the Cold War. I think what everybody recognizes is what's fundamentally different about this competition with China is that we are intertwined with, with the People's Republic of China economically, uh, and, and this is part of, of a global economic system, which you know far better than I do as, a, as an economic historian as, as well, uh, that is far different from the isolated economies in, in, of, the, of the Cold War period. So whereas we must compete, we may have to compete in different ways. But this competition, I think, gives us some more opportunities. I think, I think Larry's uh, comment about, you know, the, is, is that we do have the truth on our side is borne out by the Chinese Communist Party's failure in any way to deal with not only the Tiananmen Square massacre, but any kind of movement toward representative government and democratic governance uh, and rule of law uh, within, within China. And, and, and our colleague, um, uh, Misha Oslin, uh, Michael Oslin, has a, a great essay in, in foreign policy today about that, about, about the repression of historical memory within China. So I think we can mobilize in some ways history to counter those who say, oh, no, the, the Chinese people really like to be oppressed by an authoritarian regime or, or, or what, what I would characterize as, as bigotry masquerading as cultural sensitivity among those who, who say, well, you know, the Chinese are just kind of, you know, they're, they don't, they're really deferential to that kind of hierarchical order. It's sort of a Confucian thing that they, that they, that they can be, you know, preyed upon by their own government. Uh, and, of course, Taiwan is, is an example <laughs> to, to counter that as well. So I think we have to compete in different ways from an ideological perspective, but also uh, from an economic perspective. And we do see opportunities now, obviously. And I think what you're going to see following what has been really a concerted effort to call China out on unfair trade and economic practices, as well as a sustained campaign of industrial espionage, uh, it, it, in, in the form of uh, December 20th of last year, you know, the conventional wisdom is that the United States is on its own now. We don't work with anybody. December 20th of last year, 16 nations simultaneously called out the Chinese uh, hacking organization, APT-10, for their industrial espionage activities, sanctioned that organization, uh, and, and, and announced a number of indictments in multiple countries of individuals associated with it. And I think what the next step is, and what you've called now a, not just a trade war, but a tech war uh, with China, I think you're going to see, should I, can I quote Gwyneth Paltrow here with the conscious decoupling? I'm not sure the that's allowed, but hey. So, so, but but a, 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 a decoupling of, of, of uh, our economies such that companies are no longer going to accept the risk of operating in China uh, for short-term profits. Uh, because their, their intellectual property is then stolen and transferred to the state and used by, in many cases, state-owned enterprises to overproduce at low cost and dump goods back into those economies and drive those companies out of business that were attracted initially by short-term profits. So I, I think that what is going to happen economically, commercially, will in some ways mirror what we've seen happen with the Internet. There, there is now, I think, a divergence, and, and, our, and, and our colleague Secretary Rice has, has made this comment as, as well, you know, a, a, a divergence toward two separate systems. Now, we're going to we're gonna have to manage that carefully and, 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 uh, and try to mitigate you know, the, the downside of that, uh, but I think we're entering a fundamentally new phase in, in the relationship between the United States and like-minded countries uh, and the People's Republic of China. It's interesting that, that I think Europeans increasingly share that view. I was uh, in Europe over the weekend at a, at a conference of essentially transatlantic participants. And this conference has been going on for many years, all the way back to the 1950s. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see how attitudes have shifted. Uh, at the same conference in 2016, the view was Donald Trump could never be elected president of the United States. And by the way, Brexit could never happen. The same conference 2017, which I believe you were at, was this is the worst possible situation we could ever, ever be in. What an utter nightmare we're living through. The conference 2018 was, I guess we're going to have to get used to this. <laughs> and last weekend, they are now so on board with the Trump administration's <laughs> policy on China that there is almost no daylight between the Europeans and the United States. It's been an amazing transformation. But Ayan, I have not seen the same transformation in attitudes towards Islamic extremism. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, in that sense, the Europeans don't seem uh, at all interested in the way in which the administration is thinking about this problem. And I'm particularly struck by the fact, going back to something that you said, that if there's going to be a fight, a kind of cultural fight to combat Dawa, to combat nonviolent extremism, the Europeans are not going to be in that fight on the right side. I think what we see behind the scenes is um, there's a hope that the new crown prince of Saudi Arabia with his vision 2030, um, that if only we give them a chance, uh, if only we collaborate with you know, the oil-rich countries uh, of the Middle East and um, divert their attention away from uh, spending money and lots and lots of money and lots of uh, you know propaganda on Dawa, and instead diversify their economy, their populations will somehow come to live by the principles of freedom and tolerance and equality. They'll be just like us. Um, kind of thought what we thought would happen with China if we engaged economically with them that they yes. would become yeah. more. So that Open. is an old thing. And I think when we talk about overconfidence, I think for a long, after 1989, there's be, that sentiment in the West has been very, very strong. You know, we defeated the Soviet Union, not only on military grounds, but we defeated them in the battlefield of ideas. Communism, Marxism, socialism, that whole deal, it doesn't work. They gave up. We won, and there was just this sense of, you know, it's the end of history. Why don't they, everybody's going to come to our way of thinking and our way of doing things. But then, at the same time, that of a confidence uh, went along with an insecurity about our basic principles, the founding principles of this country. People are promoting in colleges this terrible, I mean, we're in the, grip of a terrible, terrible nonsensical idea uh, that is, uh, it, it's, it's summarized in the four letter word woke. You hear phrases like toxic masculinity, white privilege. You dive into this and what do you learn? That the history of this country is all about exploitation. It's all about slavery. We're fighting amongst ourselves to bring down the statues of the people who established our history. So there's on the one hand the overconfidence since 1989, everybody's going to become like ideas when it comes to our principles, but we are inhibited where, when it comes to propagating our principles because our principles are evil, white privilege, and all that nonsense. So I think at some point we have to come to a place where we shed this identity politics, you know, HR was talking about how our adversaries can come in and exploit our weaknesses and where we are polarized. And so if we, um, if we amplify racial, you know, confrontations, uh, a polarization between men and women, between children and uh, their parents or level of authority, uh, transgender, LGBTQ, RSD, you, you carry on, you start to fragment our society along these very thin and narrow lines, mostly based on biological ideas, then we lose sight of what these founding principles were. And so do we really, I think it is very easy to persuade the populations of the Middle East, of Latin America, of Africa, that the basic principles of classical liberalism are superior to the basic principles of radical Islamists, okay? It's very easy for us to do that. We can prove it empirically if only we propagate it. So we have to marry our overconfidence. Everything, everybody's going to become like us by actually promoting the ideas, not just the material goods. People want cars, they want smartphones, they want to wear trousers and miniskirts. That's all true, but they forget what, you know, what, is, what are the underlying basic principles? Can we sell the idea of capitalism? Can we sell the idea of free enterprise? Can we sell the idea of political freedom? If we can't do that, we'll end up becoming like them instead of them becoming like us. And I see a bit of that happening in Europe. Larry, before we go to the audience, and we are going to go to the audience very shortly, so you better think up some difficult questions for the panel. <laughs> 
Yeah. And if oh. you don't, I'll cold call some people just to <laughs> yeah. get things started. Right. Larry, you've written about a democratic recession. Uh, mm -hmm. If you take a step back and consider the, the global picture, do you feel like I am that, that there is a fundamental disadvantage uh, as far as democracy is concerned? Partly that it's an open society and therefore can't have great firewalls. Partly because of our internal divisions, which do feel worse than they were in the Cold War. Talk a bit about that democratic recession you've written about, and if there are ways of combating it. Because uh, it's one thing to observe it, uh, but the real challenge is to decide how to turn the tide back in favor of democracy. Well, you're really asking me to uh, summarize a whole book I, I've just published. So um, <laughs> you can do that. Um, Give me the yeah, elevator. Yeah, but I can't line. do it in 20 seconds. And I want to uh, I want to carry on with uh, the theme that Ayan just sounded. Let me just say these bullet points. First of all, um, if you look at the data from Freedom House or The Economist magazine or most other ratings agencies on the democracy and freedom front. We've been in a 10 to 12 year stagnation and now I think increasingly slide in terms of freedom and democracy in the world. It's been getting worse for a lot of reasons. I think um, rising income inequality is a part of it. The divisions we've inflicted on ourselves, I agree with Ayan, is a part of it. The immigration crisis and I think the lack of sensitivity and effectiveness <laughs> of, in many ways, I'd say liberal and well-intentioned government leaders, but nevertheless uh, ineffective. I think Angela Merkel was very naive in the way she handled this in Germany. Um, and you know, the election of Donald Trump shows you, you got to have your ear to the ground in terms of people's concerns about this. So I think there have been a lot of drivers of democratic dysfunction, polarization, uh, cultural backlash, whatever you want to call it. And then you've got um, the big factor that I think many people have not been paying attention to until recently, and I'd say the December 2017 national security strategy that HR, I think, led the drafting of was a big factor in helping to educate Americans and really the world that we're in a new era. It's an era of return to great power competition. We've got resourceful, dedicated, and to some extent narratively, if not ideologically driven, uh, uh, big, powerful authoritarian adversaries who are trying to dirty up, uh, sully, discredit, uh, and reverse the very idea of freedom and democracy. And we really just have to push back. Um, and we have to do so. I don't use the term Cold War, uh, Neil, but I think there are a striking number of parallels between where we were at the peak of the war, Cold War, particularly I'd say around 1960, and where we are now. And one of them was that around 1960, you know, we got back a sense of purpose and self-confidence and energy in, the, um, in, in waging this ideological struggle. It is that. And it's a struggle for freedom, for the open society, for the equal worth of every human being and against all these sources of I illiberal ideas, whether they're radical Islamist, whether they come in the Kremlin version of a kind of white Christian conservative nationalist U European uh, you know, stand against the rest of the world, or whether they come in the form of, if not communism, then the China model of authoritarian capitalism being superior. I just want to close with two points. Uh, and one also, I think, builds on what Ion said. There are a number of reasons to be more hopeful um, about the opportunity we have, not the inevitability, but the opportunity we have uh, than most people realize. And one is, if you look at the public opinion data, particularly from Sub-Saharan Africa in the Afro-barometer, you find that even though there has been, it's, the barometer is now 20 years old, even though there's been modest erosion in public support for democracy and liberal values, it remains overwhelming. Yeah. Two-thirds of people in Africa, 
and even in northern Africa, say they would like to have a democratic system of government. And often the political science skeptics say, well, if you peel it back, there's not much there. It's very superficial. They say they want independent courts. They say they want checks and balances. They say they want their presidents to not be able to serve more than two terms. And they say in various responses to questions, more or less, that they, they want to be secure in their rights and they want to have an open society. That doesn't sound shallow to me. That sounds to me, and you see it, it's a little more equivocal now in Latin America and in parts of Asia, but we've got a lot to work with. People actually do not want to live in an authoritarian uh, Orwellian surveillance state where they have no freedom, no privacy, and can be sent to a concentration camp at any point. And if we can't make that work for us in this next round of global competition, we are doing something deeply wrong or you know, ill-conceived. Inspiring words, Larry, and I want to, uh, actually, almost worthy of a round of applause, no? I mean, that sounds to me like... <laughs> Well, I want to invite you now, if you have questions, to uh, take advantage of the microphones that are standing right there on either side of, uh, of the auditorium. I want to remind you that a question is a relatively short thing with a question mark at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, and if you decide to give a speech, burly men will appear from the side of the auditorium and escort you up. Please. I'm going to give a speech. No speech. Uh, I am thank you so much for your courage and bravery and being voice of the women in Islamic world. You are a real hero. And I am so happy to be here to see you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my question, as a matter of fact, I'm looking for advice from you uh, for women like me or for me, as a matter of fact. Because I am in a like a critical situation, I would like to ask you because this is the point that I'm going to start to do something about my life. Um, you know, some years ago, Sarah Chase, advisor to General McMullen from Carnegie, was here. Mm -hmm. And um, I, as a public, never get the chance to ask the question, but afterward I could uh, tell her, share with her my idea about what we should have done in or should do in Afghanistan. And then she encouraged me very strongly to speak out, speak up and uh, all those things. And I, I have lived uh, 35 years in fear of Islam and political correctness and all of those things because I experienced the revival of Islam and what Islam is, can do and is doing with the societies. But then she encouraged me very much, and she told me one thing. She said that people in this room, it was CSAC and FSI, needs to hear from you. And she, she said to me that this, for these people, it takes 10 years to understand what you are saying. And I don't think that it means my accent. I think that other things. But I have tried to really talk about Islam, but I am coming to a crashing point right now. I feel that I am hitting my head to the wall because I feel that I am betrayed by the uh, society of intellectuals that were supposed to uh, support me. My new beautiful country of US that should support me, but I feel that everywhere that I go is this political correctness and uh, many other things. It's very easy, just come to FSI, I can show you what is happening. And right now, I am please, confused. Please, you, you've got to my get to the question. Yes, my, question is, my question is that I speak up against Islam and I'm thinking that Islam is a imperialistic, violent, pedophile ideology. And we should tell the truth, not going with the lie of the um, peaceful religion and so on. But I am crashed because people say that, don't say they kill you. We need a question, we really yes. do. We need a question. And I think she got it. And then, then, yes, I, my question is that at the same time, I get silenced down by the professors at FSI and so on, and I am crashing. And I want to ask you honestly, give me advice 
what should I do? Should Thank I very stop much. Thank you going very much. there and stop? <laughs> I, I will be very short and say, yeah, maybe at this stage, it's better to stop talking about Islam and start talking about freedom. Uh, Again, we, we are here today to talk about how we can use online and cyber and all that. And it's really, it's now become technologically possible to connect a lot of people and see the ideas that Afghani women, women from Afghanistan, and I know a number of them, are attracted to the ideas of freedom and equality and raising their children, especially their sons, to be different and to, to embrace these ideas. And I think that's where to go. Let's stop talking, or let's talk less about what it is that has driven us out of the ideology of radical Islam and talk about what has driven us to the principles of freedom. Gentlemen, the microphone, please keep it brief or others won't have a chance. <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for wonderful insights. And uh, you, know, you don't read this in New York Times, unfortunately, these days. Thank you. Um, I was uh, trying to think of a difficult question, and I uh, come up with one. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would like to get two perspectives from HR, you know, kind of fr uh, fr uh, from the inside the government, and then from, uh, I am kind of from the outside perspective. And a difficult question is this. Uh, so Muslim Brotherhood, you know, uh, it's kind of, you know, reasonably obvious that they drive a lot of this nonviolent, you know, um, jihad, if you will. You know, I, sorry for using the word. But uh, at the same time, we have failed so far to declare them a terrorist organization in the United States. I mean, we're trying. I, just re I was just reading the news that we're trying again. But it's not happening. You know, uh, so why is that? Why have we failed to declare a Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization, even though Saudis did, right? Yeah, HR. That's my question. Is the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization? Should we identify it as such? Okay, I'll, I'll go back to Ayan's point that sometimes we do try too hard to disconnect the dots with these groups because these groups are overlapping and mutually reinforcing. But I think also we have to be, we have to be cognizant of the fact that not all of these groups are the same, especially within the Muslim Brotherhood, which has different chapters that have different philosophies. Some of them are actually active and, and, and useful participants in political processes. If you were, for example, to make a blanket designation against all Muslim Brotherhood organizations and encourage other countries to do that, you just have to recognize that what you're gonna do is drive those organizations underground in a way that set conditions for post-Mubarak uh, uh, Egypt, okay? So, so I, I think there has to be a distinction made between those who advocate for violence against innocents and those who advocate uh, to, to be able to determine you know, with sh Sharia law, the nature of the government at the exclusion of other parties. And so I think that is, that's the way to, to think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and so there, there's not gonna be a silver bullet solution to the, to the problem of, of Islamist groups that wanna restrict human freedom. But, and I don't, think, I don't think a blanket designation of the Muslim Brotherhood does it for you. Ayan. I just want to add one, yeah. So I, I agree with HR. Everything he said is absolutely true. But I think we could go one step further and designate them an adversary. Just like we've designated, just like we're confronting China and what China is doing, I think it doesn't hurt to say, hey, Muslim Brotherhood, with all your branches and chapters, we know what you're up to, and here's the answer. And, uh, and that is, it's not exactly a terrorist organization, but having them come to the White House and having them you know, come uh, in our uh, institutions of education, institutions of information, I think, in that sense, we, uh, I think that's a mistake. Yeah. And I, I think just quickly, if I just make a point that maybe for the first two questions is, I think a way to think about this is for, to really make sure that we understand that terrorists are using a perverted interpretation of Islam to justify their criminal acts. And today is, you know, today is Eid al-Fitr, we ought to say, you know, Eid Mubarak to everybody. Uh, who are the greatest victims of these terrorist organizations? Muslims. It's uh, other Muslims. And so what we have to do is not play into the terrorist hands who try to, again, do this conspiracy theory that it's really, you know, it's really the Zionist crusader conspiracy against them. Really, what, what this is, 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 a, is a fight between all civilized people of all religions uh, against those who are perverting, perverting Islam. Well said. Question from the, the right-hand microphone, please, sir. Do uh, foreign governments enjoy the protections of our Bill of Rights? 
Do, do foreign governments enjoy the protections of our Bill of Rights when it comes to ownership of media and uh, of uh, newspapers, television stations, etc.? Larry, do you want to take that question? Yeah, I think the answer is no. Uh, and indeed, uh, we have blocked uh, Chinese interests from buying radio stations in the United States. You know what they did? Uh, they bought the largest uh, wattage radio station in North America in Tijuana, and from there started broadcasting over the border to Southern California. But in any case, um, I do not think uh, that foreign governments uh, have, and I don't think any court has ever established or even suggested that foreign governments have, uh, protection of, of freedom of speech or freedom of ownership uh, inside the United States. Uh, and uh, particularly when they're pursuing ideological objectives that are hostile to our Bill of Rights, I think it would be perverse to suggest otherwise. The lady in the black dress, please. Uh, I, I must say, um, I am to be in a room with you is such a great privilege to be in the room with your, your courage, courageous presence. Thank you so much. So today you've talked about Islamists, you've talked about Russia, you've talked about China as the greatest tyrannical threats, but I believe that we are surrounded by people who think that the greatest threats to their lives are plastic straws, single-sex restrooms, and Trump's personality. So I'm asking, who are the, what are the organizations we can support? Where is the greatest hope? Where are the sparks of light that the people in this room can get behind when they leave here to fight the battle that you're describing today? That, that, that's an easy one, the Hoover Institution. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're for. The last bastion is, uh, of yeah. free thinking and the principles of the open society yeah. in American academia. I think also in, you know, what we do in open and free societies is we have, you know, our internal disputes. Uh, we have conservatives versus liberals, Republicans versus Democrats, and others. And sometimes we use um, an exaggerated language to describe and analyze these differences when really it's not that exaggerated. So the kind of adversity we're facing from China, from Russia, and from radical Islam is very, very different from the adversity that Republicans and Democrats, you know, accuse one another of. It, it's, and so at times as, you know, a relative newcomer, I think we really need to mind our language and sober up a bit. Um, and maybe that will then one day get us to uh, the quaint idea of bipartisan uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, but we shouldn't confuse our external enemies that wish us harm, existential harm, with our domestic um, differences. One peculiarity yeah. uh, of the period of complacency that followed 1989 and our mistaken reading of 1989 as being all about Gdansk, Eastern Europe, rather than Beijing, was that I think in the absence of external threats, we fell upon ourselves. We divided uh, ourselves more deeply than I think had been true when there was a clear external threat. And it seems to me that one hopeful prospect uh, of our wakening up to these different threats uh, is that be we begin to see a return to bipartisanship on precisely these issues. What is the one thing that Democrats do not criticize President Trump for standing up to China. Because in fact, they were almost quicker than Republicans to endorse the imposition of tariffs on Chinese imports last year. So this may be one of the unintended but po promising consequences of this discussion that, that we're having. The lady at the microphone on the right. Thank you for the brilliant conversation. Uh, it's, a big, uh, it's a big discussion nowadays whether modern technologies, namely blockchain, AI, artificial intelligence, robotics, military robotics, can really contribute to inclusion, um, uh, decentralization of power, and um, you know, helping uh, open societies to thrive further. So do you believe in the impact of these technologies? How do you see this process going on? And maybe they can even be used against um, the free society. What's your opinion? Jai, you're thinking a lot about this right now. You were involved in organizing a really important conference just last week at Stanford on the subject. What's your, what's your take? 
Well, I just think any, any technological development is going to have tremendous possibilities associated with it and also dangers. And we learned from our most recent experiences with the internet, which many people saw as an unmitigated good, that it can be used for nefarious purposes, especially within social media, which is also supposed to be an unmitigated good. So I think what's really important is, is to understand the, the implications of these technologies for our own security and, and the preservation of our, of our way of life. And if there are dangers, to put in a place mitigating measures from the beginning, uh, but then to also accentuate the positive aspects of blockchain technology, for example, which has been, ha has, has been empowered, I think, people in a way that has, has led to economic growth uh, by being able to formalize land, for example, in ways that, that can't be corrupted, uh, and, and then also enables, uh, uh, enables maybe a flattening of, of, uh, of financial transactions in a way that is, that is more democratic. So there are positive aspects of that technology, but of course, as you know, encryption is the great example right now of, of a benefit in terms of privacy, mm -hmm. but also a disadvantage in terms of how it can empower terrorist organizations to be able to coordinate efforts broadly without detection. It was on this stage that uh, last year, Peter Thiel observed uh, that maybe AI was communist and crypto or blockchain was libertarian. And I've thought long and hard about that, but it does seem as if, if artificial intelligence is uh, going to be the basis of this new Cold War, China may have certain advantages, precisely because there are no constraints on individual privacy when it comes to the Chinese platforms mining big data. Uh, the gentleman in the pink t-shirt. Um, this question is mostly for Neil and Ayan. Um, so the recent European parliamentary elections seem to prove that no matter what Jean-Claude Juncker does, um, Brexit has not lost much popularity. And in Ayan's former country, the Netherlands, Thierry Baudet has seemed to make uh, Euroscepticism sort of chic. Um, and so I'm curious about what the possibility is of this mood um, moving to the continent and what a young American like me can do to help ensure the collapse of Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> Ayan, do you want to take that question? Well, I really want to point to some of the remarks that Larry made earlier, which was, you know, in, in, in a free society, the leadership, the people we elect, they have to hold uh, their ears to the ground and listen to the concerns of the people. And I think early on, um, the European Union was a project that started, in my view, very positive and started with a great deal of good intentions. But over time, uh, people who live in Europe are feeling that they're not being heard, that their concerns are not being taken seriously, that there are people uh, you know, the bureaucrat on a bureaucratic level who are making decisions that have far-reaching consequences for people in their neighborhoods, in their schools, in their day-to-day -day life, and that they're not being listened to. And why, when I served in the parliament in the Netherlands, I, I, I felt that was a constant thing. We would go as members of parliament to our constituencies and try to persuade them uh, in a certain direction or we would listen to them. They would persuade us and we would start you know, to get a majority for a certain legislation and we would be told, no, that, you can't pass that because it's against the EU laws. And more and more citizens would ask, who the heck are they? Are we now ruled from Belgium or from The Hague? And I think as long as Europeans answer that question with it's Brussels, you rule from Belgium, you're going to have a lot of disaffection. And you know, Heard Wilders, Brexit, this, it's an expression of that disaffection of not listening to, um, and in, in, I think in a free democratic society, if the leadership stop listening to their constituencies, then it's not a democracy anymore. Do they though, better, they better, yeah. Though it must be said that if you had wanted to do an advertisement yeah. for how to leave the yeah. European Union, <laughs> you would not have <laughs> run <laughs> British <laughs> politics the way British politics has been run over the last three years. It has had rather the opposite effect on most continental Europeans. But thanks for that question. The gentleman in the T-shirt at the other mic. Thank you. Wonderful conversation. Um, Larry partially answered this question already about China's right to broadcast in the US as a foreign government. But more generally, how do we decide what discourse is appropriate for a free and open society? Where do we draw that line and who decides? Larry, do you want to give us a quick primer on free speech? Well, I think you always err on the side of freedom of speech. And I'm not 
in favor of censoring uh, Chinese speech, Russian speech, and so on. But um, I think giving them access to airwaves or the right to buy a radio station uh, is a different thing. And if they want to spend a half a million dollars to buy an insert in the Washington Post, um, well, I guess that's their right. I'm not too worried about that. I don't think many people are reading it um, uh, in Washington. So, um, you know, I'd say always, you know, err on the side of freedom of speech. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have, I don't need, I think, to get into it here. Uh, I think Neil could give us a real dissertation on this. Um, we've got a problem uh, with freedom of speech on college campuses. And it's really, you know, um, if we can't bridge the polarization in a university campus and really look at all points of view with something of an open mind and a willingness to debate, we are in real trouble as an open society, as a liberal society. <coughs> so um, we got to turn the question back on ourselves in the university environments. I think we also need to bear in mind that as uh, the network platforms, be it Facebook, uh, be it Google YouTube, be it Twitter, come under increasing pressure from the woke left to restrict hate speech, we run the risk that there is systematic censorship practiced in the most dynamic part of our public sphere. And I think you know, our bias should very clearly be in favor of free speech. And although they're not bound by the First Amendment, something like First Amendment rights online. And yeah, that does mean hate speech, and it does mean that we'll hear arguments from the Chinese government, and for that matter, from the Muslim Brotherhood. But that's what a free society is like. The most important thing is that there should be truly an open society, and not least on university campuses. I think we've got time for one more question, and then I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint those at the microphones, because A, we've only got four minutes left, and B, there are two small boys running a mock not far from here, <laughs> and one of us has to get back uh, before the house is burnt down. So the gentleman in the blue shirt goes Brief last. Brief question. Um, this concerns uh, Chinese influence in Africa. The West has a long history of ignoring global trends that are happening, and while they sleep, things happen. I do a lot of business in China in IP and licensing, and I watched China for many years confiscate Western IP. And now we've seen the trade imbalance grow and grow and grow, and there's no redressing of that. Trump is trying. But what we're missing, of course, is the growing influence of China in Africa. It's an imperialism. They're confiscating resources. Mm -hmm. They're influencing governments, places like Congo. So what does the panel think? How big a threat is that? And what, if anything, can the West do to reverse that influence? Well, I'm going to ask each of you to respond. You get a minute each, and we're going to end with the one African uh, on the panel. Uh, but let's start with, with H HR. OK, so the, the new vanguard of the Chinese Communist Party you know, Red Brigade is, is a party official in a suit carrying a duffel bag of cash. And, and, uh, and what, uh, what they're using is, is corruption and working with corrupt governments in particular to, to co-opt those governments. And then ultimately, once they're there and they create conditions of dependency, often under the rubric of the One Belt, One Road, uh, to, to then change that to a coercive relationship in which that, co that country is used, as you already alluded to, maybe uh, as, a, as a place from which to extract what China needs, but then also to get this country to align with China's foreign policy as well. There is pushback against this significantly across the world now. The curtain's been pulled back. You have small countries like Sri Lanka and Maldives who have changed governments because of the exposure of this, the corruption of, of their own government officials. It's happened in our hemisphere in Ecuador. Uh, as well. Malaysia is an is important case with 1MDB, but also related to Chinese influence. So there's, there's a problem here, but I think there's also an opportunity in the, in the in context of competing, effectively, the first step of which I think is to, is to pull the curtain back on Chinese activity and, and expose it to some sunlight. Larry, you, you spoke eloquently about the, the African positive attitude towards yeah. democracy. Is China undermining that, do you think? Yeah, of course. Uh, I think increasingly Xi Jinping th sees democracy anywhere and the model of democracy and an open society and a rule of law as a threat to the China model. They have an increasingly global sense of this. 
But look, this is where the truth is on our side, and we need uh, public diplomacy to pull back the curtain wider, more vividly, uh, and in the view of many more ordinary people. What's going on can only be described as you know, gross neocolonialism. Uh, first of all, most of the BRI construction is coming through loans at commercial rates that are really exploitative. China calls it aid. I, I think this is, uh, if it's aid, it's a very perverse kind. And then, of course, the uh, classic instance of the uh, Sri Lankan port of Hanban Toda, you get yourself $8, million, $8 billion in debt, and the Chinese neocolonialists come along and say, well, we can write that down by a billion dollars if you give us your strategic port for, the ni for 99 years. And in Australia, you have a little bit of experience with this yourselves. So I think we just have to aggressively expose this. But it can't be all negative. I mean, we've got a lot of work to do, uh, I'd say, to um, revive uh, maybe with a different kind of logic, but re-energize Western aid flows uh, and capital flows in particular, capital investment flows and infrastructure uh, development uh, in Africa if we don't want China being by default uh, the major actor here. I think the facts are on our side. I think the natural inclination of Africans is on our side, and we just need to organize our effort and our story. Ayan. I'm going to use my one minute <laughs> um, to say something about free speech and debate and intellectual honesty, also because we're in a university campus and we know that there are a lot of problems going on in university campuses. I want to give you a demonstration. So my colleague here, HR, uh, has said a few things about the Muslim Brotherhood. And I hold a different view. Now, I have a great deal of respect for him and a great deal of affection for him. But the fact that I disagree with him, I think some of the problems we are seeing, the manifestation of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, violence, the subjugation of women, homophobia, radical Islamic anti-Semitism, I think that all of that is baked into the Islamic cake. Uh, HR thinks, you know, Islam is being perverted by bad people that are using it for other things. It is possible to sit on the same stage as grown-ups and disagree and share empirical material with one another. You don't have to hate one another. If we can do this and we can demonstrate this, then I think this, you know, we have things going. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It only remains for me uh, to thank my uh, colleagues uh, for their brilliant contributions, uh, to point out uh, that something very like Tiananmen Square might be going on right now in an African country, Sudan, in Khartoum, and China, backed by Russia, blocked a bid at the United Nations Security Council to condemn the killing of civilians in that country. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where we are in 2019. It may not be a Cold War, but it certainly doesn't feel like peace. Tom. Please. Well, I want to thank our excellent panelists. What a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. I want to thank you for coming, and I hope you can all stay with us. We're going to have a reception in the pavilion, and if you can't stay for that, I'll look forward to seeing you at our next event. Good evening. Thank you, guys.